Like the British invasion of the Beatles in the 1960s, this 1739 edition fit the same mold. Large crowds all screaming and crying. However, this audience weren't pushing and shoving to get a glimpse of John, Paul, or Ringo. They were there to see George Whitfield. And everyone, rich or poor, man or woman, wanted to witness firsthand this actor turned evangelist. In 1738, as irreligion was sweeping through the budding colonies of the East Coast of America, a great revival was sweeping throughout Europe. It was in this month of May that one of the most electrifying personalities of revival arrived on the shores of America for the very first time. This immigrant was George Whitfield. According to newspapers, he was an 18th century marvel. Whitfield, as a young boy, would skip school to practice for theatrical performances in Gloucester, England. Trading a stage for a pulpit, he would soon become one of the greatest preachers of the age. He drew inspiration from the teachings of revivalist preachers like Jonathan Edwards and John Wesley. He became a student at Pembroke College in Oxford, England. There, he joined a group of Methodists led by John and Charles Wesley that soon became known as the Holy Club. According to his colleagues, Whitfield was an extremely devout student. In fact, Whitfield was so relentless in his faith and devotion to hear from God that he fasted to the point of affecting his health. After one fast, Whitfield had to be confined to bed for seven weeks in order to regain his strength. It was that kind of dedication that he carried into his ministry. To say Whitfield was an ordinary preacher would be doing him quite the injustice. It would be like calling William Shakespeare a writer or the Beatles just a band. Whitfield was ordained as a deacon in the Anglican Church and started preaching in London. As churches began to open their pulpits to this young minister, people started gathering by the hundreds. Whitfield's theatrical training captured the audience and they would hang on his every word. He was quite the draw, but also quite the controversy. In May of 1738, he traveled to America. Whitfield was just 24 when he first set foot on American soil. He came to the state of Georgia and joined the Wesley brothers in their ministry. For three months, he preached in Savannah and established the Bethesda Orphanage, the oldest orphanage in America that still stands today. After a few months, Whitfield needed more funds for his missionary journey, so he returned to London to raise money. Word of controversial statements Whitfield made in America spread throughout London. He said that the church's leadership was lifeless and compared them to dead bodies. The churches rejected him, and soon he no. found himself without a pulpit. The churches refused to book him for speaking engagements. Since he could no longer conventionally preach inside churches, he took to holding services outdoors independently. Soon, tens of thousands of people would gather to hear him speak. Think like Woodstock or Coachella, where the main stage is not the hottest new band, but rather Whitfield and his fiery preaching. All throughout England, wherever he preached, the crowds would gather. Whitfield brought the stories of the Bible to life like no one before him. His portrayals of characters were dynamic, and he displayed great emotion both vocally and physically, and enthralled even the greatest actors of his day. The most famous actor in Britain, David Garrick, once said that he would pay a lot of money just to be able to say, oh, like Mr. Whitfield. Even Whitfield's sermon preparation was different from the local priest. Most ministers would fully write out their message and then read it straight from the page in a monotone style voice. George Whitfield gave the stories and message of the Bible depth and meaning like they had never had before. In his first year of speaking, it is said that his voice startled England like a trumpet blast. Crowds of 20,000 people are recorded to have gathered at his largest meetings. With a population of just 700,000 people in all of England, Whitfield was making quite the impact. He soon became known as the Apostle to the British Empire. George decided to return to America, not to Georgia, however, but instead he would tour the American colonies. 
Whitfield determined Philadelphia would be his starting point. Once again, his popularity grew. Like the British invasion of the Beatles in the 1960s, this 1739 edition fit the same mold. Large crowds all screaming and crying. However, this audience weren't pushing and shoving to get a glimpse of John, Paul, or Ringo. They were there to see George Whitfield. And everyone, rich or poor, man or woman, wanted to witness firsthand this actor turned evangelist. Five fourteen, take one, Mark. Action. The largest church in Philadelphia wasn't large enough to hold the thousands of people that showed up to it. Cut. Pull up the largest church in Philadelphia. Ready? The largest church in Philadelphia wasn't. What am I saying? Philadelphia? Yeah, Philadelphia. The largest church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia? <clears throat> Sorry, let's do it here. Action. The largest church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Psh, bro, I'm from California. That's how we say it there. The largest church in Philadelphia wasn't large enough to hold the thousands of people that wanted to show up to his services. So, just like in London, he moved his meetings outdoors. In 1739, Whitfield was preaching to a crowd in downtown Philadelphia when the young scientist and a famous religious skeptic, Benjamin Franklin, watched from the crowd. Franklin calculated in great detail that Whitfield spoke to over 30,000 people in a single service. According to the future founding father, the entire crowd could hear Whitfield perfectly clear without any sound amplification. His tour of the colonies became legendary. Newspaper ads announced his appearances and messengers would ride ahead to spread the word. Before the event, spectators would elbow their way to the edge of the stage, but as soon as he started speaking, the roar of the crowd fell silent. While his sermons were some of the best entertainment of the day, they also had great impact. Even though his presentations were quite entertaining, according to him, it was never for show. His presentations came from deep convictions that could not be contained. Whitfield's goal was singular, to change hearts. He believed each person must have a conversion experience to be saved, not just an Anglican baptism. Whitfield's crowds were once again filled with people from all areas of society. He even welcomed slave communities to attend. Some historians refer to Whitfield's outreach to slaves as the beginning of Christianity for Africans in America. Of course, the tour did not go without incident. At a few rallies, unruly mobs attacked Whitfield along with attendees. Whitfield received death threats, and on one occasion, he was nearly stoned to death. But despite these hardships, over the course of a 15-month period, it is estimated that 25% of the population in the colonies would have heard him preach. Whitfield's thunderous voice reawakened a spirit of revival in America that would go on to quite literally shape history. Whitfield started such a spiritual renewal, they began to call it the Great Awakening. One of the most formative events in American history. Whitfield's final sermon on his first American tour was given to a gathering of 23,000 people at Boston Commons. It's possible that never before had someone spoken to that many people at any time in history. During his tour in Boston, Whitfield spoke at both Harvard and New Haven College, now known as Yale. Historical records of attendees from the events say that the college is entirely changed and the students are full of God. After wrapping up his 5,000-mile tour of America, preaching more than 350 times, Whitfield decided to take the gospel message to Scotland. Before electricity, microphones, and cameras, in a small town called Cambuslang, thousands of people attended a service that lasted until 2 a.m. Whitfield recalled, There were scenes of uncontrollable distress, like a field of battle. All night in the fields might be heard the voice of prayer and praise. 
The following day and into the night, Whitfield preached to around 20,000 people. Then the next morning, they served communion to the crowd with the help of 1,700 volunteers. George Whitfield crossed the Atlantic seven times. He became increasingly popular as he traveled back and forth. Any questioning of his manner and methods had completely disappeared. In fact, this pastor became America's first cultural hero. Today, many might not know of his accomplishments for spreading the gospel, but in his time, he was a household name. It is said that even in his old age, Whitfield continued his tours with the same zeal as when he was younger. His body, however, could not keep up with the pace of his spirit. As his health began to fade, Whitfield would insist, I would rather wear out than rust out. In his final service, Whitfield emphasized that salvation came through faith, not through works. In one portion, he cried out, works, works? A man gets to heaven by works? I would soon think of climbing to the moon on a rope of sand. That night, hundreds of people responded to his call for salvation. The following morning, Whitfield passed away. By the end of his life, it's estimated that he would have preached somewhere around 18,000 sermons and preached to nearly 20 million people with his passionate words. All of this before the age of mass media or the internet. George Whitfield was an aggressive evangelist. And although he was ordained as an Anglican, his impact transcended race, class, and denomination. It's said that by his death in 1770, 80% of all Americans would have heard him speak at least once in person. Because of his message and that booming voice, Whitfield was able to unite the colonies with a singular passion that had never been seen before. The unity and passion he inspired throughout his messages ignited the spark for American independence just a few years later after his death.